everybody and welcome and today I am delighted to introduce Laura, Laura Rose and as we've just confirmed Rose is Laura's surname <laughs> and not just her full name um, and I just was really interested by the topic. The topic for this um, chat today is break your snack snacking habits in four simple steps. Now I'm sure that we're all guilty of snacking when we shouldn't or just mindlessly snacking and Laura has devised a very simple and easy program to help us break that habit, particularly if that habit is a mindless one that you feel that you're actually not gaining anything from. So first of all, let me introduce Laura. Laura, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to devise this program. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I help busy people stop snacking and I am passionate about helping people make long lasting lifestyle changes to support their health. So I am a um, fully qualified life coach and how this came about is I was coaching people for free when I was doing my training. And um, when I finished my training, people said, I, I want to carry on life coaching with you, which was amazing. And I said, yeah, sure. That's uh, that's uh, start. So I started a, a basically a life coaching business and they referred people and it grew and grew. And I noticed that there was a definite pattern in the things that people wanted to achieve in their lives. Um, and health so typically losing weight but when you are when you get under the skin that is being healthy and fit for their themselves their families um it was just the major theme that everyone wants and I did a um, program for a client which was about six months long and snacking was a was a part of that program but it yielded some amazing fantastic results and a lot of research went into that program and um you know my client said to me you have to find a way to get this out to the masses um and I was like do you know what I think you're right because it works so well and there is there are logical steps with behavior change. So today we're talking about snacking, but actually to change any behavior, you can follow these four steps um, and to make lasting change as well. I think we're so people want the quick fix all the time because they're living with the, you know, the issue that they're trying to solve right now. Um, and so, yeah, so I created a program specifically on snacking and to address just part of that. So yeah, that's part one really. And that's how it came to be. It's funny, really, isn't it? Because we do, you know, everybody knows about snacking and we talk about we know snacks are bad for us because generally there's something that we pick up on the go, they're quick, they're sugary or whatever it might be. And there's loads and loads of programs and, and about weight loss um, or healthy eating. And it's all around main meals. And there's less said about the in-between times the meals what do you do what do you cope with um which I, I think is quite interesting it made me after when we first met it made me really think about snacking far more than I'd ever thought about it before so do, do you want to talk us through because I know that there's four parts to your program and I think what you've said is very interesting is that actually we're talking about applying this to eating snacking but it's actually it's talking about a, a d discipline in could be applied to other things within your life as well yeah yeah absolutely I mean what's your favorite naughty snack well if I was really honest chocolate yes <laughs> or sweeties sweeties and chocolate yeah the most common answer I get to that question is um chocolate at all crisps um, people tend to be savory yeah. or sweet and yet the most common reason um, to snack less is to lose weight and but there are other reasons for snacking less as well. And, you know, that varies from your teeth. So if you go to your dentist, they'll tell you, actually, it's not very good for your teeth to eat a lot in between meals. Um, obviously, if you're over consuming your bills as well, because if a snack comes in a small snack size portion, then that is more likely to cost more than you know if you were to make one at home and also um your environmental impact people are more and more conscious these days and the best thing you can do is to if you if you don't need that snack or want to snack the best thing you can do for the environment is not to snack because it costs a lot in the packaging the transport and everything your food production to to get that in front of yes. you at that moment 
Yes, I hadn't thought about it. And of course, the other one, which is obviously very popular at the moment, is talking about one's glucose levels. Yes. And snacking is the way to just blow it out the roof immediately, isn't it? Well, I'm not a nutritionist or dietitian, which means I don't sort of tell people what to eat or when to eat. Um, you know, there's plenty of information about there about what constitutes healthy food and healthy lifestyles. But what I do is help people put what they know they should be doing into practice. So it's all about implementing behaviour change. OK, well, start me off on the path then, please. OK, step one. <laughs> So the first step in making any long lasting change is to increase self-awareness. So I don't know about you, but I can't be the only one who's ever thought I'll go on a diet tomorrow and try to change my eating from terrible to saint like overnight um, or after this weekend or after this social event. Somehow we imagine that one night's sleep will make all the difference to our motivation. Um, so one of the reasons healthy eating attempts don't last is that on day one, you launch straight into a certain way of eating, a diet, without really taking the time to understand where you're starting from. So understanding your current snacking habits will help you identify when you're most at risk of eating snacks that you would rather not. So I've got three questions here. So I'll ask these um, to you if that's all right. And people listening can ask themselves the same questions. <laughs> OK, <laughs> what time of day do you typically snack? Oh, my gosh. It, if I'm honest, it could be any time up until I finished my main meal in the evening. OK, so you don't snack after your main meal? No. OK. And Everything else is rubbish, but that's the good bit. Okay, yeah. <laughs> what kind of food do you typically snack on? Um, really, I snack quite a lot on nuts and dried fruit that come with the nuts, which is obviously not quite the, the good bit. Mm -hmm. um, and if I've got biscuits in the house, I will go and keep eating them till they've gone. Yeah, that's okay. The, that's the problem. Yeah. And when do you most often snack? So it's not in the evenings, but is it typically Monday to Friday when you're at work or at the weekends? Oh, I'm not fussy. Anytime. Anytime is fine. OK, <laughs> excellent. So, yeah, the most common answers are that people eat more snacks when they would rather not in the evenings. That's not true for you. And weekends. Oh, wow. Yeah. And actually, there isn't um, so there was an article by The Guardian out today, actually, and it, it's sort of saying that there isn't a hard and fast rule about whether snacking is good or not. But one thing that they're pretty sure about is that actually the evening snacking, if you're going to cut any snacking out, it's it's before bedtime. Um, so that's great. So, yeah. So the three questions just to reiterate is what time of day do you typically snack? What kind of food do you typically snack on? And when do you most often snack? And if you get to know those answers then you're in a good position to um, to get some long lasting results. Um, now, the Snackless program is a 30 day program and we dedicate the first eight days to this step. So all you have to do is write down what you eat um, and listen to a short daily coaching session, which is a pre recording of my voice. But my top tip here for this first step is just keep a daily food journal for at least a week without attempting to change your eating just yet. There's no need to calorie count or make it too complex, just a simple description of what you ate and when. And um, all you need for that is a pen and paper. So yeah, keep a daily food journal for at least a week is step one. And I suppose what you're doing is you're building up the awareness. And that's the thing with, with snacking is one is so not necessarily aware of when you do it, and what you're snacking on and just having that you know eight day I think he said it was an eight day period it's quite a long time to suddenly start being aware and be interesting if people start snacking less as soon as they start knowing they've got to write it down yeah exactly and that's the key because most people could answer those questions quite easily but when they have to write it down it sort of reinforces actually I am doing this and it gives you new insights into the thoughts and your relationship with that food okay so, yeah. so i've written down how naughty inverted commas i might have been during the week yeah then what do i do 
Step two is adding a daily snack plan to the top of your daily food journal. So planning when you're going to eat each day enables you to identify when you're eating unnecessarily. So if you eat something that isn't on your snack plan, then you know it's probably out of impulse. So you can see where your daily food journal deviates from your daily snack plan, and that will give you fresh insights into your relationship with food. Um, so I'll just give you a quick example of what that might what that might look like here. So I don't know if you can see that, but we've got the planned snacks at the top. You can put the the time and the food description next to it and then down here it's what you actually ate so you can very clearly be able to see if you ate something down here that wasn't up here and that will tell you oh we I, have, I ate have, something out of impulse yeah we haven't spoken about a food journal so are you suggesting that one creates a food journal journal as well as part of step one when you write down what you eat and when that is your food journal oh I see okay yeah so and then if you add your plan to the top of it uh -huh. That then becomes step two. So let's take an example. So say I write down that I plan to have a banana in the middle of the morning um, and a homemade flapjack in the middle of the afternoon. I know that this will be enough food to keep me going between meals and I'm not going to be hungry. Uh -huh. Then come the afternoon, say there's free donuts in the office at work and I eat one. What I would do is I'd put a little star next to the donut to indicate that I ate something between meals that wasn't on my snack plan. Okay. And then over time, I start to notice, oh, look, my stars are always at certain times of day or when I'm in certain environments. Maybe it's when the food is free. That one always gets me. Um, or when my mood is low or the day that I do the food shop. And actually, so I've got loads of nice stuff in the house. Um, so, yeah, you want to be planning snacks and logging stars for at least another 10 days before you actually make any attempt to reduce what you're eating. So we think we know ourselves and our eating habits really well, but our brains filter out certain information subconsciously. So people will feel tempted to not write down everything that they ate for different reasons. Um, the most common one is, well, oh, that's not a typical day for me because like I had this event. Well, social events are typical, so they should be included, which is why we do this for an extended period of time so that you've got weekends in there and opportunities for different life events to, to happen. Um, and it's only by writing down what you're eating and when in a structured way that new insights into your eating emerge. And then it's these insights that enable you to make lasting behavior change. And um, it can be an eye opener to face the delta between where you are now and where you want to be. Um, I, in an ideal world for you, how many snacks would you be eating each day? Uh, none. None. OK. Ideally, none. If I'm honest, I'd rather not do. Yeah. And that's that's quite common. Um, some people say, yeah, I, I do want to eat one snack, two snacks, three snacks a day. And that's absolutely fine. I guess it's by creating a snack plan. You're setting yourself a mini goal each day because that's the plan that you then want to achieve. So, yeah, just to reiterate then, so step one is do a daily food journal for seven days. Then step two is introduce snack planning into your daily food journal for a further 10 days. And don't start to change your eating yet. <laughs> yeah, hold fire. Keep eating those sweeties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're right. It is the, the awareness and then think and actually admitting to yourself that you are eating these things. And you're you're so right about, well, it. it I don't normally do this, but actually over a period of 10 days, I don't normally do that it can easily happen to, you know, twice. Two things can happen. Yeah, exactly. And it all counts. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> OK, ready for step three? Step three, I'm ready. Now, this is where you can actually take some action finally to start reducing the amount of snacks that you eat. Okay. So... After at least 17 days um, where we've laid the foundation for what you need to do, step three is about implementing alternative activities. In other words, distracting yourself when you want to snack 
so that you don't end up snacking. So um, every behavior like snacking is preceded by a thought about food in this case. And when this thought develops, when it's allowed to develop, it causes an increasing urge to eat and you need a lot of willpower and energy to overcome it. And willpower and energy that you may well have when you've had a full night's sleep and a piece of good news that day, but maybe not on a typical day with different life stresses. So imagine you've just had a thought about eating something. And as you continue to think about eating, your urge to eat builds and builds. So imagine a curve on a graph climbing up and up. And that curve only flattens or drops once you've actually made the decision to eat and then you've eaten. Mm. So all we need to do is to stop the urge to eat increasing in the first place. And how do we do that? By not continuing to think about the food. So that's the key strategy to avoid undesirable snacking is to recognize your first thought about eating as it's happening and then distract yourself with an alternative activity so that that urge to eat subsides. And I, I found that myself, it, it absolutely works. If I can, as soon as I identify, because sometimes you don't even identify it, you just go and you actually just go and do the snack without even identifying it. You've just gone and done it. But if I notice that I identify and think, no, I, and I'm feeling particularly strong, because there's sometimes where you think, well, I need to snack because I need to reward myself for whatever reason it yeah. may be, which is obviously a problem. But if I, and then I realise if, if I am distracted, that thought and the need, the feel that I need to have that snack disappears. I, and then a few minutes I think, God, I, I actually don't need that. I don't feel like it. I don't want it now. It, and it's amazing how it does pass. Yes. Yeah. And you're absolutely right in that it can be tricky to reliably identify the exact triggering thoughts. And that's something that takes a little while food journaling to recognize. So say I know from my food journaling that I tend to snack when I don't want to in the evenings at home on the sofa on my own. And say tonight my partner has gone out. I've got no plans except catching up with an episode of Happy Valley. And <laughs> there's sweet food in the cupboard, which is what I like. I know from my food journaling that these conditions tend to lead to me snacking. So I'm clearly at risk. But thankfully, I have a list of alternative activities to distract myself. So I decide to have a shower immediately after dinner, which is my prime like dessert time. And I brush my teeth. Now, brushing my teeth is an incentive because otherwise I have to brush them again. Um, and then when I sit down to watch Happy Valley, I also get some knitting out to keep my hands busy because it's impossible to knit and eat. Oh. So right there, you've got your three alternative activities sequenced to, you know, that's your plan of action. Um, but different thoughts, you know, there might be I'm bored. And then that develops into, I fancy something sweet. And then that develops into, I've got this in the cupboard. And then, oh, but I was going to save that for lunch this week. But then it could be, I can always get something else to go with lunch that day. And then it's, I'm going to get up and go and get a snack. And this can all happen within milliseconds. Wow. Um, because that's your neural pathway that you followed before. And that's created that habit. Um so yes, that is all you need to do. It sounds very simple. All you need to do, change those neural pathways. <laughs> um, but think about it, right? So say you, say you manage to resist a craving all evening and you go to bed with it. You don't wake up in the morning with it 10 times higher because it hasn't built and built and built all night. The urge to eat has subsided. And once you trust that that will happen, um, then you know you get into it there was a really interesting clip I think it was from um, one of the super nanny type shows and the, the child you know saw biscuits and said I want a biscuit and um, you know super nanny was trying to explain you don't sit down and have a logical conversation with a child about the pros and cons of eating biscuits and carry on the conversation about the biscuits you just say shall we draw a picture together and then all thoughts of the biscuits are forgotten assuming the child's not actually starving um but yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you know we, we can't rely on our logical adult brains to make all of our food decisions because our logical adult brain knows what's good for you and what isn't it's my inner child that seeks that instant gratification so it sounds stupid but 
if you get caught because you smell the bakery because you walk past it on your way into the office cross the road and don't look at it you know in theory you should be able to just ignore it and it's you've got that willpower but don't you don't need to test yourself just, mm. just avoid it yeah much easier less painful yeah exactly definitely <laughs> and that's step three step three gosh so i'm nearly there then I'll you are nearly there and we but we do know it's not as easy as this and that you can fall off the the wagon but it's like start well I think that you cover that if you do fall off the bandwagon isn't it yeah I guess with this there is no wagon because every urge to eat that you experience is just another opportunity to practice a distraction technique Uh so um step four recognizes that step three is going to fail (laughs) <laughs> to a certain extent, because the step four is all about refining those alternative activities and practice. So, you know, if you wanted to learn to swim, I wouldn't just give you a book about the technical aspects of swimming. You'd have to practice. And being able to only eat when you want to is a skill and therefore has to be practiced. Learning the whole discipline around food has to be practiced. So what alternative activities um, work for yourself might not work for me. Um, so let's think of some examples right so um, three deep breaths could be an alternative activity that you decide that you want to give a go Um, drinking a glass of water visualizing a holiday counting backwards calling a friend playing guitar that's quite a good one because you've got your hands busy uh, going for a run but the distracting activities you choose should be practical so if going for a run is on my list of alternative activities that I'm going to try when I next have an urge to eat, and then I'm in the middle of an afternoon at work and someone's bringing in free donuts, well, game over. If, I can't I can't go for a run in the middle of the afternoon at work personally. Um, but say I'm, I'm in work, someone's brought donuts in, they're not on my snack plan, so I know I don't want to eat one, so I know I should be implementing a distraction right now. Um, I see the donuts. I notice my triggering thought is there's free food, which is one of my triggers. I must I must get to it before it runs out. But hang on a minute. Rather than following that thought through to action, say I take I take three long, deep breaths. I go and fetch a glass of water and then I sit back down at my desk and I sit up straight and I smile. Now, plans like this work. Um, Because all you have to do is just distract yourself until the urge to eat has disappeared. Um, Yeah, I did it. Can you think of any other alternative activities that have the potential to distract you from thinking about snacking? But I think it's really interesting because it's almost primeval instincts, isn't it? If there's something there that's free or whatever it is, you've got to go and grab it. You've got to get it because you don't want to miss out. You want to take it. And then you realise, actually, you haven't missed out at all from taking it. You've actually gained from not taking it because yeah. generally it was a negative for you to have it to start with yeah yeah exactly so, um, yeah. I, I can't think what I do to distract I probably don't distract myself if honest if yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anything that breaks the thought loop is a good alternative activity so uh you might if anyone's into meditation that's listening um noticing five things that you can see or hear you know mindfulness type stuff and um, to bring you back into the world around you um you need a mix of high effort and low effort activities oh. so use the high effort ones when the urge to eat is really strong like you know it's always in the evenings for you on a friday night okay Maybe you plan an activity, go and play tennis with a friend or do something else completely different. Um, So, yeah, you need a mix of high effort and low effort ones. And ideally, you know, watching TV isn't such a good one because you can eat at the same time, whereas having a shower, it'd be much more tricky to eat at the same time. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the the guide. And I suppose some of it is also this business. And I mentioned it earlier about reward is to find something to that you reward yourself isn't something that you eat yes. it's doing an activity perhaps like you said that you enjoy doing as well yeah exactly and it's that can be programming from childhood as well 
um if you're rewarded with stuff as a child with with uh, food or like nice sweet food for example um as a treat that it, that can be really hard to unprogram but I would if you're that way inclined to treat food as a reward um think about what your alternative reward would be so if you are trying to save money then think about how much would you spend on that uh, two pounds chocolate bar or whatever and actually keep a track every time you manage to do it you know write down two pounds and eventually you'll be like right by the end of the month I'm going to have 20 pounds I'm going to go to the cinema or something um whatever that works for you um but yeah on the snackless program we spend the last 13 days in this step so it's the it's the biggest step and that is where you'll build the discipline to make long-lasting changes to your snacking habits because we just simply remove the habit. So yeah, expect your distraction techniques to fail and then you refine and you add different things to the list and you try different things instead. Um, so yeah. Wow. So just for, just recap very quickly those four steps for us. Yes. So um, if you can't remember these four steps, you can always go to the website snacklessnow.com and download the free PDF so you'll be able to see that on the home page. So, but yeah, I will just go through them now. So step one was um, identify your current snacking habits by keeping a daily food journal for at least eight days. Then step two was add a daily snack plan to the top of your daily food journal. And in step one and step two, don't try and change what you're eating just yet. It will ease you in. And then step three is create a list of alternative activities that you could use when you know you're at risk of eating something that you don't want to. And then step four is refine those activities and practice. So in your daily food journal, you should be able to see if you're still putting little stars next to things that you're eating that you hadn't planned to, you know that either you didn't distract yourself at that time where you should have done. um, And why was that? Or you tried a distracting activity and ate anyway, and then you can think, why is that? So then you can, um, yeah, work out which ones work for you in what scenarios. Great. So we can go onto your website and for free, you very kindly offered the, a PDF of how to do this. And there is an option, um, which is a paid option, where we can listen to you supporting us and helping us through that 30 day period. Is, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So if you sign up to the 30 day snackless program, it's um, you do all the food journaling as you as I've described today, but you will also get a pre recording of my voice, which you can listen to at any time of the day. Um, And none of them last longer than seven minutes. And that's really helping you to focus on the behavior change. So there'll be different activities where I'll ask you questions and you write down your answers. And the answer time is all included in that seven minutes. So it really was designed for busy people Uh, to change their snacking habits for good. And it's not just a diet. You know, you're not going to drop loads of weight in 30 days because you're not even starting to reduce what you're eating until day 17. So this is really for people who um yeah want to make those long lasting changes to their habits and i think that's what health is about now you which you identified at the very beginning it's not thinking about your actual weight loss it's thinking about being healthy and looking after your body and what you what you put into it yes yeah exactly <laughs> no absolutely fascinating and then i think that if i had a problem what i need to do is go and hear your voice again that should make me I'd go and re listen to that day and think, oh, this is what I've got. That's my distraction. Go and listen to you again straight away. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And, you know, having a structure is helpful because when when you sort of embark on this alone, so a top tip if you're going to try and do this at home without the support of the program, tell someone what you're doing and have like an accountability buddy. Um, No, I think that's a great, absolutely a great idea. Yeah. So anyway, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. That was it's really interesting. And I can see how what you're saying can apply to so many different things that we do or habits that we are we're trying to break. That's really, yeah. really useful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. That's a pleasure. Bye. Bye.